fire burning its way through New Mexico tonight, eating away at more than 5,700 acres. This video, taken by a firefighter, shows his dangerous drive to a unit at the scene of the fire. Two people killed. Federally charged and held without bail, accused subway shooter Frank James in court today. Prosecutors saying not only did he terrorize the entire city, but his attack was premeditated and carefully planned. New information tonight about the moment James was captured and the possible motive behind the shooting that hit 10 people and injured 29 on a crowded subway car in Brooklyn. The battle over abortion rights takes new turns. A ban signed into law in Florida. Abortion now illegal in Oklahoma. Kentucky effectively ending abortions. And the fate of Roe versus Wade in flux. Boosting young children as the Omicron subvariant spreads across the country, Pfizer releasing data on booster shots for kids ages 5 to 11. It says increasing protection against severe infections and the possibility of a vaccine for Omicron and other variants in just a few months. A Russian flagship sinks, and Ukraine says it was their armed forces that fired the missiles that brought it down. The major blow to the Russian naval forces pushing up against Ukraine as Russian troops gear up for a major offensive in the eastern region. The richest man in the world is ready to pay big for a Twitter takeover and major makeover. Elon Musk's $43 billion offer to the social media giant. And is it enough for Musk to fly away with the platform? From the sun to fabric, a new way to channel solar power into energy we use every day. And it could be a simpler approach than panels. Our company's Pavilion. We manufacture solar powered fabric products like tents, awnings, canopies, backpacks, bags. But this is not something that I'm seeing everywhere. But we will soon. We will soon. There's an enormous growth in the off-grid solar industry. And good evening, everybody. I'm Kana Whitworth, in for Lindsay Davis, and we're here in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for streaming with us. And tonight, we begin with new details in the investigation into that subway shooting in Brooklyn during a busy Tuesday morning commute. A critical question authority, authorities are asking tonight is, did the suspected shooter, Frank James, rush that attack? And what was his motive? Prosecutors today saying that Frank James terrified an entire city in a way that New Yorkers hadn't seen in more than 20 years. They argued he should remain in federal prison in Brooklyn and called James a severe and ongoing risk to the community, saying he had an arsenal of weapons in a storage shed in Philadelphia. Tonight, sources telling ABC News investigators are trying to determine whether James intended to carry out the attack as the train pulled into that particular stop or whether he somehow rushed the attack and set off his smoke grenades sooner than he planned. We're also learning about why those nearby cameras were not working. ABC's Janae Norman leads us off in Brooklyn again tonight. Frank James appearing today before a federal judge in Brooklyn, 48 hours after allegedly unleashing carnage and mayhem on a rush hour subway train. Prosecutors calling the attack entirely premeditated and carefully planned, saying it caused terror among the victims in our entire city. James, now represented by public defenders. We are all still learning about what happened on that train, and we caution against a rush to judgment. What we do know is this. Yesterday, Mr. James saw his photograph on the news. He called Crime Stoppers to help. He told them where he was. Yes, it was James himself who called in the tip that led to his own arrest. Police nabbing him as he wandered around Manhattan's East Village, where bystanders already had a sense that they were looking at the most wanted man in New York City. Oh, I just saw him walking behind me, and he was mumbling and saying about the FBI. And literally, I was telling my wife, I think that's him, walk faster. James, taken into custody without incident. Investigators have been piecing together clues, examining hours of video. ABC News has learned they believe James may have rushed the attack, allegedly setting off smoke grenades earlier than he planned. They think he dropped to one knee to avoid the rising smoke and opened fire from that crouched position. They say that's why the victims were mostly shot in their hands or legs. In the chaotic aftermath, police say James slipped onto another train. This picture shows him emerging from another station 
Investigators were able to determine his identity from items he allegedly left at the scene. A gun, a bright orange vest, a credit card, and the key to a U-Haul rented in his name. But those things weren't discovered until after the bomb squad cleared the area. Police say that gave James a head start to escape. Kana prosecutors calling him a severe and ongoing threat to the community, pointing to more ammunition and gun related items found in a Philadelphia storage unit to argue that Frank James had the means to carry out more attacks. He's now being held without bail, and though he did not enter a plea, his attorneys asking the judge to provide him with psychiatric care. Kana. All right, Janae, our thanks to you. And Russia's crown jewel warship in the Black Sea is now out of commission. Ukraine is taking credit, claiming missiles they fired took the ship out. But Russia is blaming the damage on an accidental fire. ABC's James Longman continues in Kyiv for us tonight. Tonight, humiliation for Vladimir Putin. Russia saying its largest and most powerful vessel in the Black Sea has sunk. Ukraine said it had hit the Moskova with two cruise missiles. Russia only admitted to a fire near its ammunition store. Either way, the ship is gone. Russia's Ministry of Defense saying the ship lost its stability as it was towed to port after what they say was a fire on board, adding the ship sank in a stormy sea. It has anti-ship missiles, it has anti-air missiles, and it has anti-missile missiles which means this should have been able to defend itself. By sea and on land, Ukrainian forces are preparing for Russia's offensive in the east, saying they booby-trapped this bridge, incinerating Russian vehicles bound for the eastern city of Izium and scorching the surrounding land. Having failed to take Kyiv, Russia is expected to unleash an even deeper fury on the east. Today, striking this factory in Kramatorsk, the city a main industrial center and entry point to eastern Ukraine. Its train station was hit just last week. 57 people were killed, mainly women and children trying to escape the fight. And after announcing a new $800 million military aid package for Ukraine yesterday, President Biden was pressed today on his administration's travel plans. Will you send senior officials to Ukraine? Well, we're making that decision now. Thank you. Who would you send? What was the reason? Are you ready to go? Are you? Yeah. And James Longman joining us now from Ukraine. So, James, this is considered not only a major military setback, but also a devastating symbolic setback for the Russians as well. Yeah, that's right, Kena. I mean, we're not sure exactly what military capabilities the Moskova had. I mean, whatever they did have, they're now lost entirely. The ship has sunk in the Black Sea. The Russians were trying to get it back to port to presumably unload what it had on board. But yes, this is massively symbolic. On the 50th day of this war, Kiev sank Moscow. And that is a message being heard across this country, just as we now hear about what the United States is preparing to provide for this country as Russia prepares to uh, invade the east of Ukraine. That is 1,400 Stinger missiles, 5,500 Javelin rockets, and 700 Switchblade drones, among all kinds of other military equipment. Kena? Wow, James. Our, our thanks to you, as always. You're doing incredible work, and stay safe. And now to the pandemic, Pfizer is preparing to ask the FDA to authorize a booster dose of its vaccine for children 5 to 11 years old. This comes as the new Omicron subvariant is spreading across the country. Here's ABC's Ariel Rushef. Tonight, Pfizer says it will ask the FDA to authorize a booster for 5 to 11 year olds after data showed a strong immune response from a third shot. The smaller pediatric dose, given six months after the second shot, increased antibodies by 36-fold. But experts say for now, parents should be reassured that two doses still give excellent protection against severe disease. It is true that giving a third dose increases neutralizing antibodies, and it will do that for three months, maybe as long as six months. But then it will fade again, and children will once again be, be at risk for mild disease. But that's okay. The goal of this vaccine is to keep children out of the hospital, out of the intensive care unit, and to prevent them from dying. That's the goal. And tonight, with millions of families on the move for the holiday weekend amid rising infections, the new White House COVID response coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha, reminding Americans to take those familiar precautions. We know how to gather together safely now. If you're going to see somebody high risk, get a test before you do that. While the BA2 subvariant fuels a fresh wave, health authorities are closely tracking two new versions of Omicron. Omicron, now making up 90% of new cases in central New York. BA212 and BA221 could be about 25% more infectious than BA2, and experts say they've been detected in more than 30 states and 40 countries. 
We don't know yet if it's more contagious or if potentially has the ability to evade the immune system. Either way, we know that they confer a growth advantage, which means that they're spreading rapidly in the community. Ariel Reshef joining us now. So, Ariel, the FDA granting tonight authorization to a new COVID breath test. That's right, Kana. That news just coming in. It's called Inspect IR COVID-19 breathalyzer, and it would be used at doctor's offices as well as testing sites. The FDA saying that if you receive a positive test from one of these breathalyzers, you would still need to confirm it with a PCR test. These tests are expect to roll, expected to roll out gradually. Kana. <laughs> All right, Ariel, also battling the wind there for us. We're grateful to you. And now to a major new setback to abortion access after Florida's governor signed a 15-week abortion ban into law with no exceptions for rape, incest, or human trafficking. It's the latest in a growing number of states enacting strict new measures. Here is ABC News congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Tonight, Florida joining a wave of states restricting access to abortion. <laughs> Governor Ron DeSantis today signing a new law banning most abortions past 15 weeks. We are here today to protect life. We are here today to defend those who can't defend themselves. The law goes into effect July 1st, and the exceptions are narrow, only made if it's necessary to save the pregnant woman's life or poses a serious risk. There are no exceptions for rape or incest. Across the country, several states have enacted laws blocking access to abortion. Just this week alone, Oklahoma enacted a law to make performing an abortion illegal, punishable by up to 10 years in prison. Only exception is to save the life of the mother. It's set to take effect this summer. The implications for people in Oklahoma are devastating. And 24 hours later in Kentucky, Republican lawmakers overrode the governor's veto on a new strict law there, forcing the only two remaining clinics in the state to stop providing the procedure while the law is challenged in court. Opponents say Kentucky is now the first state without legal abortion access since the landmark Roe versus Wade decision nearly 50 years ago. Rachel Scott joining us now. So, Rachel, lots of swift action seen today, but what is the likelihood that these bans will be challenged now in court? Yeah, well, Kana, all of these new bans will certainly be challenged in court. And so judges could put some of these new laws on hold. We know that the Supreme Court will take up this very issue later this summer. But look, the reality here is that this does not necessarily stop abortions in these states. Anti-abortion advocates that we've been talking to say this only forces patients to travel out of state now for these procedures. Kana. All right, ABC News Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Joining me now to discuss the impact of this new law, Kentucky Planned Parenthood Director Tamara Weeder. Ms. Weeder, thank you so much for joining us. And as we just heard, this law took effect immediately. So what was the situation at your two clinics today? Sure. So Planned Parenthood operates one of the two clinics. There's also an independent abortion provider, EMW. Uh, none of us were able to provide care today, and we still have not received any uh, emergency relief from the courts. So it looks like tomorrow will be another day without abortion care in the Commonwealth. With these restrictions, this law put in place, what would it take for you to be able to reopen? Uh, that is a really good question. There are so many um, barriers to reopening uh, from this omnibus anti-abortion package. The state doesn't even have forms or protocols in place so that we can comply. This is going to be a months long process, I think, before we can even see how on paper uh, for the state we would be able to comply to these brand new bills. Okay, and even before today, there were limited resources in Kentucky for women seeking abortion. What's their closest option now? Sure, so depending where you are in Kentucky, uh, it may be closer for you to go to Tennessee um, or uh, Indiana long term because we do anticipate that roe v wade will fall this summer uh, for kentucky it would be illinois after that so right now um, we are supporting our patients at planned parenthood to get the care that they legally and are constitutionally afforded their right um, in indiana okay and i understand you were at the state capitol when this legislature voted paint the scene for us what was that reaction 
It was a long day. We had um, about 10 hours of our supporters on the ground with us uh, as the bill moved its way uh, through the override process in both the House and the Senate chambers. Uh, people stayed with us from 10.30 uh, in the morning until about 8 o'clock last night. Uh, they were resolved uh, that uh, nobody uh, voting on these bills could do it without accountability. We had our voices heard ringing through the chambers, and we uh, tried to have conversations with legislators in hopes to change their votes last minute. Um, but most of the legislators ran past us with their heads down uh, as they were uh, leaving the chambers. And I know you talked about people that are seeking this kind of care going to other states to receive it, but tell us about Planned, Parent Planned Parenthood's plans uh, in Kentucky specifically going forward. Well, going forward right now, we can't provide care. I mean, this bill has effectively banned abortion in Kentucky. And so right now our doors are open, of course, to family planning services um, and education. Uh, and now navigation, it's, it's navigation to support our patients in crossing state lines. All right, Tamara Weider, we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now to these severe storms causing significant damage across the heartland, and tonight that weather is moving east. So damaging winds from D.C. to Philly, also New York and up to Boston. Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, in the wind for us now. Hey, Ginger. Hey there, Kena. Yeah, you can feel the uh, winds whipping behind the main line of storms already here. A lot of the airports around New York City had trouble. 59 mile per hour wind gusts at Philadelphia's airport it is all the line of thunderstorms that you see there. There will still be some severe weather with this for the next hour or two, but then we will get rid of it and just have some like lingering rain showers. The wind, however, behind the whip of this low pressure system have been up to 65 miles per hour with the high wind warning areas that you see in that orange. The Great Lakes all within those wind advisories, the state of Michigan, most of Wisconsin, northern Indiana and Ohio. And then look, the red flag warnings extend all the way down to New Mexico, where they've had relative humidity as low as 2%. Some of the wind gusts up above 70 miles per hour, and that's where they had those deadly fires. The fire conditions are going to be tough for the next 24 hours. Kena? All right, always adding that wind is really hard on a fire. Ginger, thank you so much. Yeah. And when we come back, the push to an all-renewable future could come in part from technology that you can wear, the unique way you can don solar power and combat climate change. Also, the scary moments after a Tesla driver says his car computer froze while it was traveling at 83 miles an hour on the highway, all while Tesla's Elon Musk is making a strong bid to buy Twitter. How the company is now responding. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest views in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck, and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently, and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? 
I won't ask you again then. Are you an IT? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. And welcome back. General Motors is unveiling its new electric Cadillac. GM is hoping that its new version of the American Classic will take on Tesla. The company is already committed to selling all electric vehicles. Rebecca Jarvis spoke exclusively with the CEO of GM, Mary Barra, about her goal to take over the market by 2025. Tesla, though, is number one right now. They own 60% of the market. That's three years away. You've got a ways to go. Well, uh, absolutely. But if you think about it, right now, EV sales are very low. They're in single digits. You know, by, by uh, you know, 2025 and then beyond, we want to start dramatically growing share. Well, today, a California state board revealed plans to stop selling gas-powered vehicles by 2035. And the board is set to finalize that plan in August. You can catch more of Rebecca's interview with Mary Barra tomorrow morning on Good Morning America. Well, next tonight, Tesla founder and CEO Elon Musk has offered to buy Twitter for $43 billion. The company's board says they're deciding if that is in the best interest of shareholders. Musk has accused the social media platform of limiting free speech and now says taking it private is the only way to transform the company. Kaylee Hartung reports. Tonight, the richest man in the world is launching a takeover of Twitter. Hours after Elon Musk announced his $43 billion offer for the social media platform, telling an audience at a TED conference that it's not about the money. I think it's very important for uh, there to be an inclusive arena for free speech. Musk, the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, is worth an estimated $265 billion. He's a prolific tweeter with more than 80 million followers and also one of its biggest critics. Just last week, he disclosed his 9% stake in Twitter, making him one of the largest shareholders, sending the stock price soaring. Musk will have to show his ability to finance the deal to the Twitter board, and that's why this is a soap opera that's going to have many twists and turns ahead. And if refused by the board, Musk writes, I would need to reconsider my position as a shareholder. If Musk decided to just cut and run, I mean, the stock could go down 30, 40 percent. This forces the board's hand. And Kaylee Hartung joining us now. So, Kaylee, what comes next here is a bit of a waiting game. Yeah, exactly, Kana. So Twitter's board has said they will review this proposal and they'll do what they say is in the best interest of the company and their shareholders. Elon Musk has said this is his best and final offer. But today on that TED stage, he admitted if his proposal's rejected, he has a plan B. He just wouldn't elaborate on what that is. Kana. All right, Kaylee, I think we'd all be surprised if he didn't have a plan B, right? We appreciate you. <laughs> joining us now for more is Bloomberg reporter Sarah Fryer. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we heard Musk this afternoon say he's not sure that this will succeed. Twitter shares are already changing hands this afternoon. They ending the day down slightly, perhaps signaling investor doubt in this deal. So how will Twitter respond and how likely is it that he takes over the company? Morning, where they're discussing options about what to do next. They haven't put out a public statement yet, but you know, Elon Musk's comments about this are, are worth thinking about. He says he, he's not sure if he's going to be able to do this because that's a lot of cash to have liquid. He would have to probably either sell stock, do some debt financing, work with a bank. He'd have to come up with a plan to get all of that money up front 
or work with shareholders now. Um, ultimately, his goal is to take Twitter private, which is which is um, something that he says will allow it to have more control over their content moderation. And on that note, he describes himself as a free speech absolutist and says Twitter needs to be transformed. So in particular, what ideas is he really offering up to change the site? When he was speaking today, he, he offered up a bunch of ideas such as you know, not fully banning someone unless absolutely necessary. If content is in a gray area, err on the side of leaving it up, allowing people to edit their tweets after posting them, um, per perhaps deleting all the retweets and likes on that after they posted. So if you were to ask Twitter what they think of those ideas, the company would probably tell you they're they're already doing a lot of that. Uh, there's not a whole lot that they do that tries to go beyond um, the requirement, though they have worked a lot in recent years to reduce the amount of harassment, to reduce calls to violence and stuff of that nature. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, Elon Musk seems to have um, a lot of ideals about free speech, but he says he does not have the solution yet and doesn't know exactly what he would do if he were in control. Right, I mean, some people concerned here that blanket free speech might have unintended consequences. Right, well, there's a, there's a lot to be said about um, unfettered ability to, to be racist, to be harassing, to... Um, to go after somebody. And, and I think that that is what Twitter has been trying to respond to in recent years is that a lot of people feel that using the platform, they can be easily targeted. Even Elon Musk, there are some types of tweeters that he would like to ban. He said that at his speech, it is, I should say, interview today at TED, he said that he's interested in, in getting rid of a lot of the Bitcoin scams that are rampant on Twitter. So, you know, even a free speech absolutist realizes that there are some areas where Twitter just can't have unfettered open talk. Right. His fellow billionaire Mark Cuban seemed to suggest that Musk putting out a bid for Twitter might actually spark a bidding war between other social media companies to try and buy Twitter as well. Do you see that happening? I think, you know, we've been here, done that with Twitter. One thing to keep in mind about this company is the, the ownership setup is very different than other tech companies such as Facebook, such as Snapchat, Google, where the founder has the majority of the voting control. That is not the case here. Twitter's been through bidding wars before. They've been through activist investor interests before. And, you know, they wouldn't be a stranger to that sort of process. But I don't think that... Um, it would be something that the company would look forward to. All right. Well, Sarah Fryer, our thanks to you. And still ahead here on Prime, the outrage tonight over that police shooting in Michigan. It was all caught on body camera. Also, Texas Governor backtracking tonight after a move of his caused massive delays at the border. And a popular fitness company, Peloton, yeah, they're raising monthly dues. But some say it's a savvy move. We go by the numbers. But first, our post of the day. All of us here at ABC are celebrating our very own Robin Roberts, who marked 20 years on Good Morning America this morning. The deeper you go into black market, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? 
<laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. And welcome back. The popular but embattled streaming fitness company Peloton announcing price changes today. So let's take a look at the company's efforts to gain new users and turn around its falling stock price by the numbers. So Peloton all access subscriptions will cost $5 more per month, raising the monthly cost to $44 starting June 1st. That is the first price increase since the company began eight years ago, which Peloton says will allow it to continue to develop new content and products. The $12.99 monthly fee to access digital classes that are not connected to that equipment won't change. And Peloton equipment prices are dropping. So now $1,445 for the basic bike, $1,995 for the bike plus, and treadmills start at $2,695. That is a three to $500 price reduction. Peloton boomed during the pandemic with its stock peaking at $167 a share last January as Americans forced to work at home drove an enormous demand myself included. But the stock has plummeted back down to $24 today as new user growth has slowed while the country and gyms are starting to reopen. The company's value dropping to about $8 billion after peaking at $50 billion. And in February, the company cut about 2,800 jobs, shedding hundreds of thousands of dollars in annual expenses and replacing its founder and CEO. But there were about 6.6 .6 million total Peloton members through the end of 2021, and they seem to be really committed, averaging 15.5 workouts every month. So that is considered a lot higher than their other competition. And the number two, which is the number of hours my mom would spend on a Peloton every day, if she could, she's an animal. And we still have a lot to get here to tonight on Prime, a solar revolution, how unique uses of solar can help combat climate change. And there's only been 23 in history. Tonight, the controversy after the LA Dodgers pulled Clayton Kershaw while he was on his way to pitching a perfect game. And the unconventional rise to fame for this week's TikTok guest. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. 
These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Frank James, the suspect in Tuesday's violent rampage on a New York City subway train, made his first appearance in a Brooklyn federal courtroom. He's charged with violating a law that prohibits terrorist and other violent attacks against a mass transportation system. The government will prove, among other things, that James traveled across state line in order to commit the offense. The assistant U.S. attorney, Sarah Wink, said in court the defendant's attack was premeditated. It was carefully planned, and it caused terror among the victims in our entire city. Authorities said James boarded the Manhattan-bound N train during the morning commute, detonated two smoke grenades, and began shooting. Overnight, demonstrators in Grand Rapids, Michigan, demanding the officer who shot Patrick Leoya be held accountable. After community pressure, authorities Wednesday... No, no, no. Stop. Stop. Put your hands right. Releasing video from the officer's body camera, dash camera, a bystander's cell phone, and a nearby security camera, all capturing the fatal encounter April 4th. The unidentified officer pulling 26-year-old Leoya over because the plate on the car wasn't registered to the vehicle. Leoya gets out, eventually tries to run. He's also seen fighting with the officer and wrestling to get the officer's taser after the officer deployed it. After demanding Leoya release the taser, the struggle ends with the officer on top of him drawing his firearm and shooting Leoya in the head. Attorney Ben Crum says Leoya's family is devastated and in disbelief. And as a parent, I was thinking maybe it was my son who was going to bury me. He will assist at my funeral. But what is so astonishing, I am the one burying my son. This owner of a Tesla Model 3 is speaking out about his safety scare. I noticed that it started to get hot in the car and it started to started there started to be uh, a weird scent. Javier Rodriguez says that's when his Tesla's computer screen suddenly froze and the accelerator wasn't responding while the car was going 83 miles an hour on this California highway. He says the brakes did work and he was able to make it off the road and then the car rebooted and seemed to return to normal. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has reached out to Tesla for information about the incident. Former Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows has been removed from North Carolina's active voter list as the state investigates allegations of voter fraud. It comes after the Macon County Board of Elections Directors says her staff found records that Meadows was registered in both Virginia and North Carolina. Voting in Virginia in 2021 and North Carolina in 2020, but the New Yorker is reporting that Meadows registered in 2020 using the address of a mobile home where a previous owner says Meadows never spent a single night. 
The fight over immigration policy between the state of Texas and the White House is intensifying. Governor Greg Abbott recently ordered commercial trucks coming from Mexico to undergo extra inspections, a move that led to major backups at the border, with some truckers waiting 30 hours to enter the U.S. Truckers protested, setting up blockades like this one in Juarez. And in the process, 18 trucks were burned, apparently by the cartels. Yesterday, Governor Abbott relented. He agreed to ease the inspections at one border crossing, but some of the biggest bottlenecks have been elsewhere. Another payoff. Another strikeout. Excitement reaching a fever pitch at the end of the seventh inning, with the 34-year-old just six outs away from pitching a perfect game. Seven perfect innings from Clayton Kershaw. But then the Dodgers benched him. Manager Dave Roberts unwilling to risk injury to make history on Wednesday. Even Reggie Jackson tweeting, take him out? What the? What's the game coming to? This is baseball. Please, people that have never played, get out of its way. All right. Well, also, it's an exciting time for high school seniors, but sometimes the transition to a college setting, setting can be really difficult, especially for athletes. Kayleen Wells Bracken joined Vanderbilt's University Division I lacrosse program, but halfway through her first year, she decided to take a break from the sport and take care of her mental health. She wrote an open letter imploring coaches and colleges to consider that inside every student athlete is someone who might really need some help. ABC's Lara Spencer has her story. A collegiate athlete speaking up, urging schools, coaches, teammates, and parents to focus on the mental health of student athletes. What can we parents and administrators and teammates and coaches do to help? So I want for student athletes and for parents to have an open communication. One of my favorite things to tell myself if I'm not succeeding in the way I want to, I'll put my hands on my heart and I'll just say, I love you and I'm listening. And I want people to experience that from their coaches and administrators. I want there to be grace on all ends. When Kayleen Wells Bracken was a freshman at Vanderbilt University, she struggled with depression, saying her life became defined by her successes or failures on the field. She says her coaches were supportive, though, when she made the difficult decision to step away from the team. If I had a good day at practice, I was happy. And if I had a bad day at practice, I didn't want to talk to anyone. I was investing so much of my worth in lacrosse. Now Bracken is opening up about her personal experience, writing an essay called A Letter to College Sports, saying, quote, I want coaches to look at players like humans rather than commodities. I want athletic administrations to recognize that the pressure they impose on these young adults is intolerable. I'm so grateful people are listening. I had a father reach out to me and tell me that after reading the essay, he drove two and a half hours to his daughter's across practice and waited outside to give her a hug. Ugh. And it was the most beautiful thing because it's exactly why I wrote it. In her letter, Bracken mentioning college athletes like Stanford soccer star Katie Meyer and Duke lacrosse player Morgan Rogers, who both died by suicide, saying when she hears stories like theirs, she feels fear because, quote, it scares me so much to wonder if it could have been my team, if it could have been me. But Bracken says she was one of the lucky ones, receiving the support and time that she needed from her team and her coaches. And as a result, she is once again on the playing field, feeling strong both mentally and physically. She writes, quote, I was able to navigate my way out of the darkness instead of letting it consume me. And that's what you'd like other schools to do, to follow Vanderbilt's lead in that capacity. I want other coaches to just say, hey, how can I be here for you? Because I never, ever want a coach or a parent or a teammate to see a situation like Katie Meyer or Morgan Rogers and say, I wish I had done more. Well, that's an important story. Lara Spencer, thanks to you. And now to the increasing number of ways that the sun is powering our future. And we're talking about solar power, but it doesn't just mean those big panels on your roof. There are these innovative solutions that are already being used that could help curb the effects of climate change, and you can wear them. Ginger Z has this week's It's Not Too Late. Hi, I'm Ginger Z, and it's not too late. Today I want to talk about solar energy, and not the kind that we all know a little bit about on the rooftops, but this behind me. That canopy right now is powering this electric vehicle. 
solar only makes up 4% of our nation's energy grid. And while that number is expected to quadruple in the next eight years, it's a slow go trying to get folks to embrace those big panels on roofs. But those rooftop panels or acres of solar farms are not the only option. That's why today we're talking about micro solar solutions, off-grid, things that can make power on every surface, like this coat, this bag. Solar patios, driveways, windows, and airplanes. Imagine if every surface on the planet had the dual purpose of creating energy from the sun. It would be game-changing. Solar energy could power 50% of our country in the next three decades, according to the Department of Energy. But that still requires big investments. And these companies argue any way to add more renewable power to the grid only speeds up the transition to a clean energy future. Our goal really is to say, if there's a piece of fabric that's getting hit by the sun, it's an opportunity to generate electricity. In this warehouse in the Dumbo neighborhood of Brooklyn, there's a company that's busy producing a different looking solar panel. Well, our company's Pavilion. We manufacture solar powered fabric products like tents, awnings, canopies, backpacks, bags. But this is not something that I'm seeing everywhere. But we will soon? We will soon. There's an enormous growth in the off-grid solar industry. What you're doing is saying, I'm going to set up a tent, I'm going to set up solar panels, I'm going to have batteries, I'm going to have AC outlets to charge my equipment, laptops, cell phones, etc. There is a huge growth in that industry. And we also see a big growth in any solar on any surface. Pavilion told us that almost half their business is making tents for government and military, which is already helping in conflict zones and natural disasters. Had we had this technology when Hurricane Michael uh, devastated Tyndall Air Force Base, it would have given us the capability to be able to move a lot leaner because one of the biggest and heaviest things that we take with us every time we go out the door is our own fuel. Right down the street here in Brooklyn, pavilion product is being used on that pergola. We are at a rooftop vineyard called Rooftop Reds. All the solar panels on our pergola uh, structure here, uh, primarily they, they uh, uh, power all the lighting in every row on the railing system up here on the rooftop, just creating the ambiance here, but doing it with renewable energy. But solar fabric is not the only option. There are companies like Ubiquitous Energy that are making windows into solar panels. If you think about the glass buildings that go up here in Manhattan, being able to utilize the entire floor to ceiling window, because some of these are 10 feet, 20 feet bigger. <laughs> Exactly, and, and that's really the, the opportunity that we see utilizing the vertical surface of buildings as vertical solar farms, essentially. In a lot of cases, there's much more surface on the vertical part of the building than on the rooftop. That's a big opportunity for energy generation. So if you apply this to a commercial building, you could offset up to 30% of the energy use in that building uh, right on site with the existing windows. Ubiquitous says that rolling out their technology could make a big dent in our emissions. This technology was broadly adopted over the next 30 years. The glass of the buildings all around the world could offset up to 10% of global carbon emissions. And so that kind of just gives you a sense of the scale, you know, the amount of glass that's installed and the amount of energy we could generate if we turn that glass into an energy generating asset. And if every surface on a building could produce up to 30% of our energy, imagine what we could do if we changed our sidewalks and driveways to solar. The Hungarian company Platio is trying to do just that. They've created solar panels made with recycled plastic that work as you walk on top of them. The idea is that you, you can generate energy with solar in solar form, farms or on the roof, but there is a much wider range of uh, uh, areas that you can, you can install this product and, uh, and, and you can bring closer to, to, to micro micro usage the, the the product with micro solution or with solution these technologies can generate power for all types of buildings homes to major skyscrapers and unlike the solar panels on your roof you don't have to connect these to the power grid the future is to support the individual energy uh, production and usage as well which is which is the, the most efficient uh, way of uh, energy supply on individual Light level with 5,000 feet, 
Bertrand Picard has been trying to show off the potential for solar energy for decades. In 2016, he flew around the world in a solar-powered plane. That's more than 26,000 miles without a drop of fuel. Bertrand just wants to swarm the market with solutions to our energy challenges and prove, most importantly, it can be profitable too. It is a little bit like what I like to call the piranha theory. You know, if you are in a river in South America and you have a piranha, these little fishes that comes and bite you, if you have one, it doesn't harm you at all. You don't feel it. But if you have 1,350 piranha coming at once, you are a skeleton in one minute. And this is exactly what I want all these 1,350 solutions to become. You know, each one will grab some waste, will grab some CO2, will grab some inefficiency, will grab some pollution. At the end, you can have a much better world with completely new and modern infrastructures, new modern systems. Using energy from the sun is nothing new. Optimizing it and making sure that everyone has access to it, that's what's gonna help us ensure that it's not too late. Our thanks to Ginger Z for that. And now let's turn to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we interview some of our favorite TikTokers, taking a closer look at the story behind the sensation tonight. Our next guest had an unconventional rise to fame. 21-year-old Hype House co-finder Alex Warren went from being homeless and sleeping in his car to finding a massive following online and now stars in a Netflix reality show with more than 20 million followers across all platforms. Alex is here to share his one in a million story of becoming a social media sensation. Alex, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so people might not know is that your road to social media success took nearly 11 years. So did you always feel like you were going to be a huge deal on this platform or did you have a plan B? No, there was no plan B, but I, I, I lost hope. I definitely did at a certain po moment. And there was a moment where I was homeless and not able to kind of find my roots, and, and I felt like the, all the cards had been dealt, and I was just not going anywhere. So you had some lows. You had some highs as well, though. Your show Hype House aired this year. Uh, what is it like to film with your friends? You all live together in this gorgeous mansion in Los Angeles. Is there anything that didn't make the cut somehow that you wish did? Oh, there's plenty of things that didn't make the cut. That's the thing with reality <laughs> TV, though. We filmed for almost a full year or like a, something around there. And, and I'd say maybe 30% made the cut. Oh, well, because you really feel like you're really in there with all of you. So what, <laughs> what in particular didn't make the cut? Um, there's a lot of moments where it was just kind of like, some serious stuff that a lot mm. of us got to share, like about our lives and just, it didn't intertwine with our character arc. So uh, I ended up being cut, but nothing, nothing too crazy. <laughs> right, it's not, I, I, I get what you're saying though. It's not always fun, right? You've been really open about your childhood. Your father sure. passed away when you were young. You were homeless at 17. You lost your mother in October of 2021. So how did you find ways to cope with all that grief and, and being so young? I think honestly making the content. Once I once I realized that my story was something that everyone wanted to hear and everyone wanted to see and, and inspired so many people just because when I would grow up watching all these people and, and seeing all these amazing creators or even celebrities, I was like, this is not fathomable. Like I can't make that. Like that with the cards I've been dealt, this is impossible. And to be able to show people that I, and it's so corny, but genuinely speaking, I'm able to be where I am because of the cards I was dealt. So it, it's something miraculous and something beautiful out of something terrible. Yeah, and, and it's not corny. I mean, you've really made made a, <laughs> the best of it. And you're also documenting your personal health journey on TikTok. So what prompted you to share those really vulnerable moments with your fan base? Um, I think just understanding it was more, I, I've always been reluctant to share about me. A lot of my content is centered around my friends just because of how insecure I've been about myself and yeah. kind of the way I looked and the way I was picked on as a kid because of it. So it's always been like, oh, here's my friends. I'll stay behind the camera. And this last year after the Netflix show, I've really, I came out with music. I have a podcast and I've done all these things that are centered around me and everyone has loved it. It's something that I realized I, I was hiding for no reason and it was all in my head. 
You also have a lot of collaborations with your girlfriend, and sometimes that can be really hard to share those personal moments and that personal relationship so publicly. That that heart card, though, was one of my favorite ones. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I've centered it around me and me and my girlfriend were long distance for four months. She's from Hawaii. I'm from here, and our story is amazing. She was homeless with me. Uh, I told her I had a place to stay and that she should come move out here. And so she moved out here assuming I was going to actually have a place to stay. And uh, I said, sorry, I'm homeless. And she goes, let's do it together. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're in it through thick and thin. I get it. You're also a musician, though, so let's together take a moment to listen to part of your song, Remember Me Happy. Battles on my stone, remember me happy. We're not even at all. These thoughts are monsters in my head. All right, so uh. what stage of your life do you feel like that song represents? Uh, I wrote that song the day my mom died. I, I got a phone call that uh, she had passed after I went and saw her. And um, yeah, there was a lot of, I didn't know what, I, I, I don't know how to process things. I think with kind of the feeling of everyone kind of dies in my life, or at least the feeling that I've gotten from that, it was kind of remember me happy is there was a lot of bad. My mom passed away because of alcohol abuse. So something where, you know, her liver failed and she was in renal failure. And um, there was a lot of, lot of, lot of bad things. And I didn't want to remember her as that. I wanted to remember her as happy. So I wrote it as if it was her on her deathbed being like, how would people remember me? Wow. And, and that's a powerful way to process something though. So tragic. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. you. You mentioned you have a podcast coming out. It's called Locked In. Yeah. So what can listeners expect? It's, it, it follows the same theme of what I've been kind of talking about today. Um, it's really, there's a lot of cool stories with a lot of creators where, you know, when it, if it's Tana, maybe mental health or, uh, you know, her relationship with her family. And, and I've been able to have the pleasure of meeting these people and being friends with them. And they have such amazing stories that no one gets to hear. And hence why I created the, uh, the podcast. You're locked into a room for 60 minutes and I throw a little charade of a crime that you so-called committed. And, and it gets their mind off of like, kind of like what we're about to talk about, which is very therapeutic. It's kind of me asking them hard hitting questions that they're not used to answering. Like they genuinely tell me like the things I'm asking, like whether it's their mental health or whether it's, you know, addiction and stuff they've gone through. It's just a beautiful thing to be able to see a, a story like that. And I feel like it's my responsibility as someone who's gone through it and feels this way to kind of curate that space to do so. Yeah. Oh, that's an excellent platform. Looking forward to that. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. I really like talking with you. Thanks for helping. <laughs> Thanks for talking to me. <laughs> I feel like it's helping right. me through therapy a little bit. Uh, listen, we're here anytime, okay? Amazing. <laughs> All right. So Alex's new podcast, Locked In, debuts April 20th. <laughs> And before we go tonight, the image of the day. I hope you're hungry. On this 13th day of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, an Egyptian confectioner in Cairo makes a traditional oriental dessert called kunafa ahead of the fast-breaking iftar meal. Well, that's our show for this hour. Please stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, we're watching a few developing stories. Russia's threat in the Baltics tonight after Finland and Sweden say they plan to join NATO. Also, the joy of childbirth that so many get to experience looks a lot different for women of color. Our in-depth report. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, 
the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Kana Whitworth, in for Lindsay Davis tonight, and thank you so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The man charged with opening fire on a New York subway was ordered held without bail in his first court appearance today. Frank James, whose Wednesday attack left 10 people with gunshot wounds and countless others scrambling to safety, was seen in court today answering questions. And in Virginia court, one of these so-called ISIS beetles has been convicted for the kidnapping and deaths of four Americans a decade ago. El Shefe El Sheikh, a British national, was captured in Syria in 2018. Surviving witnesses testified to the group's brutality, including beheadings. And among their victims, journalists James Foley and Stephen Sotloff, also aid workers Peter Kasich and Kayla Mueller. El Sheikh is expected to be sentenced to life in prison. And in Buffalo, New York, emergency crews are racing to save a World War II destroyer. The USS The Sullivans suffered a major hull breach and is sinking at a Navy park. The ship operated in the Pacific Theater during World War II. It recently celebrated the 79th anniversary of its launch. And a major setback for Russia and their war in Ukraine after the flagship of their Black Sea fleet has sunk. Russia saying that an accidental fire on board was the cause, but Ukraine claims it was destroyed by its missile strike. ABC's James Longman is in Kyiv with details. Tonight, humiliation for Vladimir Putin. Russia saying its largest and most powerful vessel in the Black Sea has sunk. Ukraine said it had hit the Moscow with two cruise missiles. Russia only admitted to a fire near its ammunition store. Either way, the ship is gone. Russia's Ministry of Defense saying the ship lost its stability as it was towed to port after what they say was a fire on board, adding the ship sank in a stormy sea. It has anti-ship missiles, it has anti-air missiles, and it has anti-missile missiles which means this should have been able to defend itself. By sea and on land, Ukrainian forces are preparing for Russia's offensive in the east. Having failed to take Kyiv, Russia is expected to unleash an even deeper fury on the east. Today, striking this factory in Kramatorsk, the city a main industrial center, an entry point to eastern Ukraine. Its train station was hit just last week. 57 people were killed, mainly women and children trying to escape the fight. And after announcing a new $800 million military aid package for Ukraine yesterday, President Biden was pressed today on his administration's travel plans. Will you send senior officials to Ukraine? Well, we're making that decision now. Thank you. Who would you send? What was the reason? Are you ready to go? Are you? Yeah. And that was James Longman reporting for us tonight. Also, as the war rages on in Ukraine, Russia continues to make threats against NATO, sending a strong message about Sweden and Finland, who say they plan to join. ABC's Inez de la Cuerta has the details on the possible battle in the Balkans. Hey, Kena. Yeah, so one of Russian President Putin's closest allies, Dmitry Medvedev, who is also a member of Russia's Security Council, threatening to deploy nuclear weapons to the Baltic region if Finland and Sweden 
join NATO. Russia does have a little bit of territory in the Baltic, so the Kaliningrad province, which is sandwiched right between Poland and Lithuania, so that is likely where those weapons would go. And Russia also shares a border with Estonia, Latvia, and Finland, and Russia threatening to bolster its border defenses as well. Both Finland and Sweden have for more than 70 years been reluctant to join NATO, choosing to stay neutral and non-aligned militarily. But the war in Ukraine has prompted both both countries to reconsider. And public support for NATO in both Finland and Sweden has soared. Finland's prime minister saying her country would reach a decision within weeks. Now, this all comes as the leaders of the Baltic, so Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, were in Kyiv this week meeting with Ukrainian President Zelensky to show unity and support for Ukraine. And the big irony here is that the war in Ukraine started in part because Russia wanted assurances from Ukraine that it would never join NATO, saying that would pose a security threat to Russia. The last thing Putin wanted was for NATO to expand. And yet it is starting to seem increasingly likely that two more European countries, Finland and Sweden, could soon join the alliance. Kena. All right, Inez, thank you very much. And now to the pandemic. Pfizer is preparing to ask the FDA to authorize a booster dose of its vaccine for children 5 to 11 years old. This comes as the new Omicron subvariant spread across the country. Here's ABC's Ariel Rushev. Tonight, Pfizer says it will ask the FDA to authorize a booster for 5 to 11-year-olds after data showed a strong immune response from a third shot. The smaller pediatric dose given six months after the second shot increased antibodies by 36-fold. But experts say for now, parents should be reassured that two doses still give excellent protection against severe disease. It is true that giving a third dose increases neutralizing antibodies, and it will do that for three months, maybe as long as six months. But then it will fade again, and children will once again be, be at risk for mild disease. But that's okay. The goal of this vaccine is to keep children out of the hospital, out of the intensive care unit, and to prevent them from dying. That's the goal. And tonight, with millions of families on the move for the holiday weekend amid rising infections, the new White House COVID response coordinator, Dr. Ashish Shah, reminding Americans to take those familiar precautions. We know how to gather together safely now. If you're going to see somebody high risk, get a test before you do that. While the BA2 subvariant fuels a fresh wave, health authorities are closely tracking two new versions of Omicron. Omicron, now making up 90% of new cases in central New York. BA212 and BA221 could be about 25% more infectious than BA2, and experts say they've been detected in more than 30 states and 40 countries. We don't know yet if it's more contagious or if potentially has the ability to evade the immune system. Either way, we know that they confer a growth advantage, which means that they're spreading rapidly in the community. Our thanks to you, Ariel Reshef. And also tonight, investigating fraud during the pandemic. When the government leaders shut down the country in 2020, the federal government also gave out $800 billion in forgivable loans to small businesses in the hopes of keeping the economy going. But that led to many instances of documented fraud. About 500 defendants so far with criminally, have been criminally charged with defrauding business relief programs. So right now I am joined by award-winning ProPublica journalist and the author of the new book, Pandemic Inc., Chasing the Capitalists and Thieves Who Got Rich While We Got Sick. David McSwain, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So in this past week, you took to Twitter to share your journey on the reporting for this book. You wrote, let me tell you a crazy story. It's consumed two years of my life. As COVID-19 shut down the world in April of 2020, I decided to follow the money. I began with a call to a no-name federal contractor who'd somehow landed a $35 million deal for masks. Hours later, I'm on a private jet. Quite a way to start there. So, David, this kind of started for you like many of us. You had been stuck in your apartment for weeks. What was it that initially signaled you to the fact that wide-scale fraud was taking place? Well, yeah, these were those really scary weeks. I'm, I'm here in Washington, D.C., and we see that the Trump administration is trying to catch up, and there's just this outflow of hundreds of millions of dollars. And we started looking at the contractors who were getting these awards, including the one you just mentioned, and realized these were people we hadn't seen before. They're, it's, they're, it's awarded and so quickly. There seems to be no vetting. And, uh, you know, before you know it, I'm, I'm on that private jet. Find, you know, I ask, how, how do you 
have these the six million N95 masks he claimed to have for the Veterans Administration and its hospitals, and he, you know he admits he doesn't have the masks, and that really set me off, uh, just digging into people that we had to rely on because we weren't ready to address the pandemic. You also investigate PPP loan fraud, people taking advantage of unemployment benefits. What are you finding in addition to lack of oversight? We're going to be catching up to this for years. Sure. Uh, each each one of these cases needs to be, you know, prosecutors and law enforcement are going to have to t tackle these one at a time. And you know, in the Paycheck Protection Program, which really prioritized speed above all else to get money to small businesses and make sure that employees could feed their families and, and pay the rent, uh, it, it's just unprecedented fraud and. And, and waste. Right, ultimately the hardworking American people paying for it. Uh, your right. reporting also, though, you know, really brought you face to face with a lot of these people committing these crimes, even catching one of these confrontations on camera. So let's take a look. Yeah, I'm trying to talk to Mr. Wexler. I'm not on your property. I'm not on your property. Are these sterile vials you have here? How are you sterilizing these vials, sir? Are these sterile? Okay, David, so walk us through what we just saw. What sure. brought you to that warehouse, and what did you find? Uh, this was a company called Filicate. We noticed, just looking over who's getting these deals, that they, they formed right around the outset of the pandemic, about six days later, very quickly, got a $10 million contract with the Federal Emergency Management Agency to provide COVID-19 test kits. And at the time, the country, we were lagging behind on testing. It was a huge problem. Mm -hmm. It set us back, back in our ability to address the spread. And looking at it, these look like the PCR tests, the real ones where you, you have to send them to a laboratory. Story. So we put it in a story, and I heard from, uh, as a result of that, from state health workers who told me, hey, we've seen these test tubes, and they're completely unusable. Uh, and I happened to be in Texas when we were sort of chasing this down, so I stopped by the warehouse, and uh, they weren't too, sad, too happy to see me. In what way are the American people left to pay the price for the government's mishandling of this? And is it still happening as more money is still being put in to pandemic response? Right. Well, it's gotten a little better just by virtue of having a little bit of time and weeding out some of these fraudsters, but we really were so ill-prepared. After about a decade of, of defunding the strategic national stockpile, we had only something like 1 percent of what we needed in terms of like masks and gloves to address that first wave. So we had no choice but to reach out to these buccaneers and pirates, as, as one of my yeah. uh, you know, characters refers to them. So, you know, they just had an opportunity to take the federal government and states for a ride and taxpayers got screwed. So the, the hope is this book really is a blueprint of exactly what not to do when we're faced with such a crisis or a pandemic, which, uh, you know, scientists say is inevitable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So listen, do you think that those responsible will be held accountable? I mean, we know pleas have been entered, we know charges have been filed, but in the end here, do you think everyone will be held accountable? And in the end, what does justice look like? I don't think we're going to catch them all. I think we're going to see some really, as I account for in the book, some really crazy, uh, just silly instances where the government just did not do due diligence and people took advantage. And those people might be made an example of. Right. Wow. Well, David, excellent reporting. Thank you so much for uh, talking with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And of course, his book, Pandemic Inc., is available right now. Now tonight, according to the CDC, the maternal death rate among black women is two and a half times higher than white women. This week, the Department of Health and Human Services announced $16 million will go towards addressing these disparities. But at this moment, the joy of childbirth that so many get to experience really looks a lot different for black mothers. Janae Norman has that story. These babies, just days old, were born in one of the world's wealthiest countries. But for their mom, it's one of the deadliest. I continuously say that this is an SOS situation. We must save ourselves. The United States has the highest death rates for new moms among industrialized nations. And according to the CDC, black women in America are nearly three times more likely to die than white women in childbirth or from pregnancy-related complications, regardless of their education and income level. 
We know that the consequences of racism, sexism, gender oppression are causing us to die within childbirth. Experts say the reasons, though broad ranging from disparities in health care and underlying chronic conditions, point back to structural racism and implicit bias. The pandemic prompting many women of all races to seek more holistic support. Enter the midwife, a trained health professional that provides care throughout pregnancy, labor, birth, postpartum and beyond, assisting births at home, in birthing centers and in hospitals. Nubia Earth Martin is one of countless midwives on the front lines fighting to save the lives of women dying giving birth. Studies show that for low-risk pregnancies, midwife-led care is linked to fewer medical interventions and better birthing outcomes for both baby and mom, including decreased risk of needing a C-section or to be induced and decreased infant mortality rates and risk of preterm birth. 32-year-old Nicole Amwako delivered her first child in the hospital, but has chosen a home birth with a midwife for her second. Being with a midwife, especially the midwife team that I've chosen, one that is not only culturally competent, but is from my community, makes me feel safer, 100%. Your prenatals are much longer, and so you're able to share any questions that you have. And I think that the resources that you're able to get from a midwife are oftentimes really supportive um, and helpful during the duration of your pregnancy and birth. But some expectant moms may face hurdles in seeking alternative care, like prior pregnancy complications, underlying medical conditions, or even restrictions from insurance coverage. When you have somebody who maybe is healthy, having a low risk pregnancy, wants to give birth with midwives in the comfort of their home, and then the insurance won't cover it, then they have to make a hard decision to enter into the medical industrial complex where they might not want a birth, and yes, in some situations may not survive. Wow. All right, all right, Janae Norman, uh, thank you so much. And Celsi, come here. Our look around the world, including the devastation in Myanmar as entire villages have been burned to the ground. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back, everybody. We are tracking several headlines from around the world. New images to show you out of Myanmar. These are villages burned to the ground in the central part of the country. Human rights groups and area residents say that government troops are torching the region in an attempt to quell resistance from fighters. And the United Nations reports that more than 52,000 people have fled their homes in the area, and that 
was just in the last week of February alone. So that number is likely to be much higher as the violence continues. And in South Africa, the death toll continues to rise from heavy rains and flooding in the region around Durban. At least 341 people reported dead. And again, that number also expected to rise. The rains destroyed homes, collapsed buildings, and washed away major roads. At least 120 schools were damaged, forcing them to close. Officials say right now they're facing $52 million in damage, and more rainstorms are forecasted for the area in the coming days. Also, Queen Elizabeth will not attend Easter services and other events this year. Prince Charles and his wife Camilla represented the royal family at the traditional pre-Easter service to present money to the elderly today. The Queen, who turns 96 later this month, has been suffering from mobility and other health problems. Also tonight, uh, the increasing number of ways that the sun is powering our future. We're talking, of course, about solar power, and it doesn't just mean those big old panels on your roof. There are innovative solutions that are already being used that could help curb the effects of climate change. Ginger Z has this week's It's Not Too Late. Hi, I'm Ginger Z, and it's not too late. Today, I want to talk about solar energy, and not the kind that we all know a little bit about on the rooftops, but this behind me. That canopy right now is powering this electric vehicle. Solar only makes up 4% of our nation's energy grid. And while that number is expected to quadruple in the next eight years, it's a slow go trying to get folks to embrace those big panels on roofs. But those rooftop panels or acres of solar farms are not the only option. That's why today we're talking about micro solar solutions, off-grid, things that can make power on every surface, like this coat, this bag. Solar patios, driveways, windows, and airplanes. Imagine if every surface on the planet had the dual purpose of creating energy from the sun. It would be game-changing. Solar energy could power 50% of our country in the next three decades, according to the Department of Energy. But that still requires big investments. And these companies argue any way to add more renewable power to the grid only speeds up the transition to a clean energy future. Our goal really is to say, if there's a piece of fabric that's getting hit by the sun, it's an opportunity to generate electricity. In this warehouse in the Dumbo neighborhood of Brooklyn, there's a company that's busy producing a different looking solar panel. Our company's Pavilion. We manufacture solar powered fabric products like tents, awnings, canopies, backpacks, bags. But this is not something that I'm seeing everywhere. But we will soon? We will soon. There's an enormous growth in the off-grid solar industry. What you're doing is saying, I'm going to set up a tent, I'm going to set up solar panels, I'm going to have batteries, I'm going to have AC outlets to charge my equipment, laptops, cell phones, etc. There is a huge growth in that industry. And we also see a big growth in any solar on any surface. Pavilion told us that almost half their business is making tents for government and military which is already helping in conflict zones and natural disasters. Had we had this technology when Hurricane Michael uh, devastated Tyndall Air Force Base, it would have given us the capability to be able to move a lot leaner because one of the biggest and heaviest things that we take with us every time we go out the door is our own fuel. Right down the street here in Brooklyn, Pavilion product is being used on that pergola. We are at a rooftop vineyard called Rooftop Reds. All the solar panels on our pergola uh, structure here, uh, primarily they, they uh, uh, power all the lighting in every row on the railing system up here on the rooftop, just creating the ambiance here, but doing it with renewable energy. But solar fabric is not the only option. There are companies like Ubiquitous Energy that are making windows into solar panels. If you think about the glass buildings that go up here in Manhattan, being able to utilize the entire floor to ceiling window, because some of these are 10 feet, 20 feet bigger. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's really the, the opportunity that we see utilizing the vertical surface of buildings as vertical solar farms, essentially. In a lot of cases, there's much more surface on the vertical part of the building than on the rooftop. That's a big opportunity for energy generation. So if you apply this to a commercial building, you could offset up to 30% of the energy use in that building uh, right on site with the existing windows. Ubiquitous says that rolling out their technology could make a big dent in our emissions. 
This technology was broadly adopted over the next 30 years. The glass of the buildings all around the world could offset up to 10% of global carbon emissions. And so that kind of just gives you a sense of the scale, you know, the amount of glass that's installed and the amount of energy we could generate if we turn that glass into an energy generating asset. And if every surface on a building could produce up to 30% of our energy, imagine what we could do if we changed our sidewalks and driveways to solar. The Hungarian company Platio is trying to do just that. They've created solar panels made with recycled plastic that work as you walk on top of them. The idea is that you, you can generate energy with solar in solar form, farms or, or on the roof, but there is a much wider range of uh, uh, areas that you, you, can, you can install this product. And, uh, and, and you can bring closer to, to, to micro micro usage the, the, the product with micro solution or with solution. These technologies can generate power for all types of buildings, homes to major skyscrapers. And unlike the solar panels on your roof, you don't have to connect these to the power grid. The future is to support the individual energy uh, production and usage as well, which is, which is the, the most efficient uh, way of uh, energy supply on individual level. light level with 5,000 feet. Bertrand Picard has been trying to show off the potential for solar energy for decades. In 2016, he flew around the world in a solar-powered plane. That's more than 26,000 miles without a drop of fuel. Bertrand just wants to swarm the market with solutions to our energy challenges and prove, most importantly, it can be profitable too. It is a little bit like what I like to call the piranha theory. You know, if you are in a river in South America and you have a piranha, these little fishes that comes and bite you, if you have one, it doesn't harm you at all. You don't feel it. But if you have 1,350 piranha coming at once, you are a skeleton in one minute. And this is exactly what I want all these 1,350 solutions to become. You know, each one will grab some waste, will grab some CO2, will grab some inefficiency, will grab some pollution. At the end, you can have a much better world with completely new and modern infrastructures, new modern systems. Using energy from the sun is nothing new. Optimizing it and making sure that everyone has access to it, that's what's gonna help us ensure that it's not too late. Ginger Z, our thanks to you. Uh, so to come here, this man almost didn't make it alive. Tonight, though, the critically burned man in a fire is getting a second chance at life. It's an incredible story. We'll be right back. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was Diva. drama, money and fame, Shaw amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms.
And welcome back. A man critically burned in an explosion is back to living his life again, thanks in large part to the staff at a regional burn center in Orange County, California. Today, he went back to the place where he healed to show his appreciation. Jessica DeNova with our partner station, KABC, right here in Los Angeles, shows us in tonight's local lowdown. An emotional reunion at the UCI Health Regional Burn Center. Michael Zimmer returning nearly half a year after severely burning his body in a propane tank explosion. All of a sudden I just seen this raging flame come at me. The blast last November blowing him out of his van, leading to more than two months in this burn unit. Wrapped in bandages, his eyelids covered in blisters. Zimmer recovering in Arizona with his family, lost his voice during his visit back to California from catching up with friends. The burn survivor grateful to his loved ones and staff here for helping him fight on. You didn't give up on me. No. You didn't give up on me. You pushed through too. Two surgeries later and after beating pneumonia, learning to walk and talk again, workouts five days a week and physical therapy, Zimmer now even golfing. I'm actually able to golf a little bit. Don't ever go out and hit 100 balls at the driving range. Mm -hmm. I did that, I was sore for four days. <laughs> he even got the chance to body surf before his visit here. Dr. Teresa Chin credits her patient's progress to team effort. As the only burn center in Orange County verified by the American Burn Association, a lot of severe burn victims come here. We see them at the worst, and so seeing them and what it can end up as and how uh, he's doing really great, getting back into life, reintegrating. Um, and that's something that we really focus on in the burn world, is really getting back into society. Zimmer not taking for granted his second chance. My future's here to come, you know. Oh, wow, I'm sure that was incredible for the doctors to see his progress. Uh, Jessica DeNova, our thanks to you. And that's our show for tonight. Please stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kana Whitworth in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for streaming with us. America's number one news.